Yeah, not enough for seats. How about that? Good turnout. Thanks all for coming. Lovely to see you all in person. It's been a while. We're well out of practice of doing this face to face thing. Where's the screen? Oh, here's the screen. We've actually probably got some people online. I'm not sure how many were running this as a webinar online as well. We'll see how that goes. Hopefully, it's not a complete dead loss. Not as interactive as the uh, sessions we ran during lockdown, but it's what it is. Thanks for joining you online. Okay, let's kick this thing off. Uh, a few people are going to join me on stage at the appropriate time to say a few words about various things. It's just not Jerry Bob Down. It is. It's almost, <laughs> it's almost as clunky, isn't it? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Result. Woo! Technology guide. Yeah, maybe. I didn't listen to us. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do. Oh, Brent. It's supposed to be Brent. It's me. Oh, well. Life goes on. Bit of a welcome to health and safety. Who knows the health and safety? I don't. Nobody told me. Rick probably does. Yeah, head out that way if we need to. The bathrooms are out that way. The square's over there. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get out in an orderly fashion. Then you start to come and help with that. Uh, Graham's going to do a quick pitch, lucky for him, on the recent changes to the privacy law. Then Len from Sentinel CSI is going to join us. And Nigel, where's Nigel? Hey, there he is. Thank goodness he's here. Otherwise, you had to listen to me even more. That would be bad. Newest members. Hooray! We have some. Amazing. When everybody else is losing them, we seem to be adding them. <laughs> Great, we'll take it. Uh, I'm sure some of you are in the room tonight. Hands up if you are. Hooray! Welcome! Those of you who are old hands, go and shoulder tap these guys and talk to them later on. Thanks all for joining. Oh, the NPS stuff, we're always very proud of it. It bombed. One of the last bombed. Okay, it went down a few points. <laughs> it went down a few points because well, I had some finger trouble with the online stuff. That's the trouble with using Zoom and pushing the limits a bit. Uh, you have to know how to use it, and uh, I forgot some things. Oh well, life goes on. We got there in the end. We got there in the end. Mentoring scheme. Ian in Wells has really been behind this, and he's going to come and say a few words. But before he does, he's been one of the key people. So give. Ian, a big round of applause. Well, so, Ben, you know, we've been running a mentoring program, two mentoring programs. Um, and we have, this is coming up, we've got 78 people involved as either mentor or mentee right now in two concurrent mentor programs. And this is also, I'm not the only person here, say Ku and Kay Johnson and also Dale have also been working on. <laughs> On this team to uh, set up a mentoring program. We ran it last year as well, it was the first time. How many people here are in the room right now are either a mentor or a mentee? There's only some fantastic. It's just uh, we had an overwhelming response. We actually had to turn away mentors and mentees from this last program. So we're uh, just uh, I really want to maybe I just want to thank everybody who's signed up for it and we're really looking forward to your feedback too on um, how we can just keep making this. Um, meeting a need of people both who are entering the tech field and also um, having people who are already in the tech field just be more aware of what's, what the situation is like for people coming into the field in Christchurch so we get more tech workers here in Christchurch. So thank you everyone. Thanks Ian. Look, I think this is one of the most worst, worthwhile things we can do and it seems to be working quite well, not least because of the efforts of a few volunteers. Um, last year we were 
we're aiming to use some software developed up in Wellington this year. We haven't been able to do that, so there's been a lot more manual work behind the scenes by this man and a, and a small number of others. So we hope it's successful for all those involved, and we hope to run it uh, again next year. A few upcoming events. I'm not going to read them all out. A few local ones there. Um, Tech Week, I'm going to bang on at you. So Tech Week is only in a few weeks' time. It's not too late to organise an event. They can be online only, although they have opened it up so that you can run them as a blended event online and in person. But running an online event is pretty straightforward, really. So no excuses. Have a think about what you've got to say to our local community or even uh, wider than that. Um, Tech Week TV is a, is a national online Thing that's streamed throughout the country, so they're looking, still looking for a few uh, people or panel events to stream via Tech Week TV. So if you have any interest, come and talk to me after this. And the High Tech Awards. Um, another of my hats is a trustee of the High Tech Trust, and the High Tech Awards is postponed, but is running on the 21st of August. Simultaneously, Auckland Wellington Christchurch. And thanks to our friends at Tate for providing the venue. I'd love for you all to buy tickets, but they're all gone. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's because it's a relatively small venue. What I'll be pushing for is to run it in all three cities again next year and to have a bigger venue in Christchurch. We'll see if I get my way. I usually do. Not always. <laughs> Somebody else? Jacob? That is me. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Jacob. So I'm here to talk about the Health Tech Supernaut Challenge. The Health Tech Supernaut Challenge is a free accelerator program uh, organized by Christchurch and said KiwiNet and Ryman Healthcare. Uh, so we are looking for uh, great innovative health technology ideas uh, under three categories, aged care, rural care, and an open category. So we're really looking for disruptive, innovative uh, uh, technology ideas to solve some of the biggest healthcare problems that we face. Uh, applications are open now. Just go to the healthtechchallenge.co.nz. We have uh, cash prices. Uh, I mean, we have prices to the value of three hundred and forty thousand dollars. Waiting at the end of the program, the six-week program itself will be delivered by Ministry of Awesome. So I'm Jacob from Ministry of Awesome and UC Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, so go and apply. Uh, the last date is sixteenth of uh, August, uh, and uh, if you win, you potential seed funding from WNT Ventures, clinical trials with uh, the Canterbury District Health Board, uh, cash prize from Ryman and other things as well. So there are three application streams, one for uh, medium and small scale enterprises, uh, one for startups, and the third one for researchers and students. So if you need any more information, come and speak to me or go to the website. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Summer of Tech. Um, I'm trying to get Summer of Tech, a few more employers engaged with Summer of Tech in, in Canterbury this year. Please take a look at it. It's a worthwhile internship program that runs elsewhere. There are other options, of course. So we're not favoring Summer of Tech over other programs, but saying to employers, have a look. Um, several hundred students from University of Canterbury signed up for it last year, and only, I think, three three got placed with local employers, with hundreds being placed in uh, Auckland and Wellington. So we'd like to see some of those locally educated students getting involved in internships because in turn, many of them turn into uh, employ employment relationships in due course. Have a look, please. This is, you'll see us promote some events from uh, sister organizations uh, from other super nodes, and this is this is one of them. So they ran an event early for COVID to tell people what it was about. This is a after the fact, if you like, the latest on the virus, the vaccine, blah blah blah. You can all read. 23rd of July. Please take a look. It should be interesting. The podcast. My friend and colleague in the front row here, Andy is the front man for it. I'm kind of behind the scenes. Sometimes I do some talking. 
Um, we've done six of these podcasts now. The idea was, they've been running for several weeks, the idea was to stimulate more debate about the role that technology plays in our post-COVID economic recovery. Kind of preaching to the converted, really, people in the room. Um, you, you know that, well, I've been banging on recently about technology being both a horizontal, it enables a whole lot of other industry sectors, and it's also a vertical. It's a, uh, an industry in its own right that generates significant exports. So have a listen. But one of the key things that I actually want to do is, is take uh, what we've uncovered, uh, debated, talked about in these podcasts, and turn them into some written and other materials to uh, figure out what we actually do with that and how we advance that cause, if I could use that word, um, and actually drive a clearer strategy for uh, technology as a sector locally. There's a bunch of things happening on this front. MB have a, uh, an industry transformation plan for digital that got paused over the COVID period. It's revving up again. That's one thing that we want to feed into. We also want to feed in some ideas into uh, Christchurch NZ and MB who are looking for opportunities to invest. Well, there's some over here. We just need to figure out specifically what they are. So, meantime, take a listen to the podcast and feed into the where we take this debate over the coming weeks. And we do have a date and a venue for Tech Summit this year. It's not going to be at Wigram. It's going to be at Ridges Latimer Square. A good quality event, but a slightly uh, smaller scale this year. What's happened, unsurprisingly, is that sponsorship funding is a little harder to find this year. So what we're aiming to do is a good quality event in a, a city in a city venue at a slightly more modest scale. It will be available as an in-person event. There will be a charge for everyone because we have to make the budget work. Um, you'll be able to join it online as well. So 24th of September, a full day. An after, uh, a theme, a stream in the morning, another one in the afternoon, you can attend the whole day, or one half of the day. There'll be a bunch of networking in there as well. So I know a lot of people come to Tech Summit for uh, the networking opportunities as much, if not more, than the content. Um, so we're making sure that there'll be networking opportunities over lunch and um, nibbles and drinks in the evening. More detail in due course. Somebody else with Graham. There he is. He's come to tell us about Woohoo! Privacy Act 2020. I know. Come on now. Give the man a chance. <laughs> Hi, yes, I know. Well, this is really the most exciting thing to have uh, someone talked about law. Um, I'm Graham Crombie. I'm a corporate partner at Lane Me. Specialise in technology and particularly privacy and data protection. <laughs> so, at the end of last month, the government finally passed the new privacy legislation, and we have the Privacy Act 2020. It comes into force on the 1st of December, so we've got five months to get ready for it. Two key changes um, it introduces mandatory reporting of privacy breaches. Um, where they uh, involve serious harm. There's some new powers for the Privacy Commissioner, and um, particularly around issuing compliance notices to people who aren't complying with privacy legislation. Um, there will be fines of up to $10,000 applying to uh, non-compliance with these issues. Four key things. Um, update your privacy breach response plan to cover the reporting um, requirements around a breach, including working out whether you have to report. Check your security practices and staff training. So basic security elements like two-factor authentication and encryption should be in there as standard. Staff should be trained so that they know how to um, detect and report um, potential threats 
how to understand basic account security. Check your privacy processes. So are you fully compliant? Does your privacy policy actually comply with what the law is based on what we're doing? Um, marketing initiatives have met a lot of privacy policies get a little bit out of whack. Um, and lastly, look at your contracts with providers who deal with personal information uh, to make sure that they uh, will also report breaches to you, will securely look after the information and will fix any potential issues. We've got some uh, seminars coming up in August, probably mid-August. Look out on our website if you want to know more about this. Uh, also check out the uh, Privacy Commissioner's website, who's got plenty of information as well. Uh, or talk to me after uh, the uh, main speaker during the networking. Um, that is it for me. Thanks, Graham. This is where I unplug the screen so you can't see all my unseemly fiddling trying to get uh, Lynn's presentation going, but bear with me for a moment. We just had to run this as two separate. I rock. Woo! Lynn, um, the very brief intro. Uh, Lynn's general manager at Centennial and Canterbury Seismic Instruments based at UC, or used to be, maybe not anymore. Okay, not anymore. All right. Uh, tonight's theme, which we forgot to mention, is kind of tied into the smart cities thing and uh, the work that Lynn and team have done in conjunction with. Christchurch City Council won a gong recently, uh, which Len's going to talk about, among other things. Shoot. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, I assume this is all working? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll take that. Thanks very much. If I were to move on, keep it. Keep it. Okay, good on. Uh, already on the first slide. So, uh, yeah, look. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, uh, and I actually, being Christchurch, I actually know quite a few of you, I realise. Um, my name is Len Damiano. I'm the General Manager of uh, Canterbury Seismic Instruments, or CSI. Sentinel is a new subscription service that we've developed, uh, which incorporates the lessons that we've learned from the earthquakes in the past 10 years and um, in terms of what people really want and what people really need to help them better manage earthquake effects. So I'm not going to talk about COVID tonight. I'm taking you back to something far more interesting, earthquakes. <laughs> um, probably, probably the first thing is that we know we're all New Zealanders. We live in, a, we, live in uh, we live in New Zealand, the Shaky Isles. There are a lot of earthquakes, but what does that actually mean? Since 1840, um, we've had about 170 earthquakes greater than magnitude six, and about 25 greater than magnitude seven. That means. <laughs> that means uh, each of those earthquakes is capable of causing damage um, if it's in the right place. So there is an ever-present risk. It, it's, it's everywhere, as you can see from there, even places like Auckland, um, which everyone thinks is, uh, you know, uh, it's a volcano, no problem. There are, earth, there are earthquakes everywhere. If you notice the little gap down, down in the South Island, that's where the Alpine faults expected to rupture. So that's pro possibly why there's nothing there. What about Christchurch? Christchurch was low risk, wasn't it? Nothing was supposed to happen here. That's what actually has happened in the last 150 years. We've had basically one uh, damage-causing earthquake at least every decade, and sometimes multiple. 
but there was a quiet period from about uh, 1970 through to, to uh, 2010. So was it really low risk or was it just forgotten? If you're running a business, if you're in a building, you've got people, you're responsible for them, what do you actually do? And I ask, ask yourself the question, what would you do today if it was your business and there was, a, there was an earthquake? Do you keep going? Do you hope for the best? How do you make that decision? Perhaps you look at GeoNet. What, what, will you, what will you find from GeoNet? You'll find the magnitude of the earthquake and where it was. What does that tell you? Absolutely nothing. That's an example from the Kaikoura quake, which I think everyone will probably remember in 2010. There's the epicenter, the blue star. Hamner Springs is the green dot just above it. 10 kilometres away, minor damage. Christchurch, 100 kilometres away, bit of liquefaction. Wellington, 200 kilometres away, 100 buildings damaged, 30 plus buildings demolished last time I uh, was counting, and at least $3 billion in, uh, in uh, material damage costs. And that was a, that, that $3 billion was estimated in early 2017, and nobody's bothered counting since then. A few senses is not enough. What we've found, and this is where this is, these are results directly from the trial supported by Christchurch City Council and Smart Christchurch. There is a huge amount of shaking variation over very, very, very short distances. It was something we all observed in the Christchurch earthquakes. You could walk down a street, buildings are undamaged, 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 destroyed, destroyed, destroyed. That's an example from a small quake. I think it was about a magnitude 4.5. I think from memory it was January 20. Uh, 2019. Um, if you look at the four green stations around the outside, that's shaking relative to New Zealand building code. So 100% meaning the capacity of a 100% MBS building. Over at the Catholic Cathedral, it was 15%. Over in the Botanic Gardens, it's 3%. So across the city, there was a variation of a factor of five in that quake. Looking across our temporary network, across the centre of the city, most of the shaking was actually generally towards the lowest end of the, of the scale, but there was one site, interestingly enough, the cathedral, which was very, very much higher. Previous experience isn't useful either. Every quake is different. Every quake produces a different shaking pattern, no matter whether the epicenters are, are similar locations. The way the waves move through the soils, the way the soils interact makes it extremely, I'll be generous, I'll say extremely complex practically impossible to, uh, to actually model or predict. We thought, particularly after an experience in the Kaikoura quake and what happened in Wellington, we thought there's got to be a better way. We, we knew there were major problems in Wellington almost instantly. Why did they keep the city open? There's got to be a better way. And this is what we came up with. And can I... Yes, better oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, slightly scaled. So picking up a few key points in that. The first thing is, because of the shaking variability in our major urban centres, we need to measure shaking in hundreds of places. We've developed a whole range of uh, technologies, ranging from uh, hardware, embedded firmware, all based on our, uh, on our seismic instrumentation that dramatically lower the, uh, the uh, 
the cost point of doing those hundreds of measurements. That, those, are, those are real maps of uh, sensor feeds into, into Sentinel, and you can see the density in Christchurch City. Right now, there are sensors in this building, there are sensors in the nearest traffic signal cabinets, which produce, produce free field ground shaking. They are literally every 100 to 200 metres apart in the CBD. That's the sensor down the bottom on the, the, the little yellow box with the T-stick sticking out of it. Um, the, the size of a, about that size. <laughs> the, se the second key point is that it is no point, there is no use in just measuring ground shaking. You have to convert it into something that is useful and some kind of useful metric that someone can use to make a decision about a building. We, can, we convert the, um, the raw acceleration data, the time series data, into, a, um, into a, um, a ground response spectrum. I won't bother explaining a whole pile of structural engineering here, but fundamentally it means that the ground shaking in its spectral form can be compared to the New Zealand building code. So it can be compared to any building, where short or tall, old or new, uh, new code, old code, somewhere in between. And the final part of the system is an alerting system because obviously it's no use knowing all this information if you can't tell anyone. We've simplified things to, and, um, and this is what most people get, everyone gets a traffic signal, traffic light signal type of system. We have condition white essentially, which means that the shaping is such that it's below the building's service limit, which means the building can be used normally. We have condition amber, which means it's above the service limit where you might start expecting to see cosmetic damage. And that could be quite serious. It could be um, ceiling tiles falling out, lights falling out, water pipes bursting, electrical systems failing. But the building structure remains uh, okay within its design capacity. And condition red means the building has exceeded its design capacity. So now, what's your decision with Sentinel? If it's red, you activate your full ERP. You evacuate the building. You know you're probably not going to be back in that building for some time. You know you need to make other plans. Condition amber. You'll need some kind of inspection before re-entry. It might be a small inspection. It might be quite a significant one. But you'll need to do something before you re-enter the building. Condition white. No action required. You are below the service limit. You can keep operating. You can keep operating when all those nervous people and those buildings around you have evacuated and have stopped. You know your business priorities across the city. If you're a multi-site business, you can instantly understand which of your sites are most likely to have been affected and where you can uh, uh, direct your most uh, urgent efforts. You know that your family is safe and that your home is okay. That means you can concentrate on what you need to do. The single thing, knowing what is likely to have happened to your family and friends was the single biggest comment that we got from talking to people after the Canterbury quakes. As they said, if I had known what had happened, I wouldn't have had to rush home, rush to school, rush here, rush there. But it's not just the instant decisions. It's not just those instant decisions in the two, two minutes after the earthquake. Months after the earthquake, you evacuated your building, ongoing problems with damage assessment, insurance. We all know what it's like in Christchurch. What does the insurance company say? We're not paying. It's not earthquake damage. And I can, uh, I can uh, quote you quite a few interesting examples of where they have, uh, insurance companies have said exactly that. You trying uh, using some data to justify it. Sentinel provides the evidence, indisputable evidence, that you made the right decision and the right call. I think we all know that in the case of the earthquakes that information uh, asymmetry leads to a suboptimal outcome. If the insurance in industry has this information, they have it and they will use it against the building owner who doesn't have it. On the other hand, if it's the other way around, the building owner is in a much better position. When both parties have the same information, you get a faster, speedier, quicker, more certain resolution. And so that's Sentinel. That's where we are now. That's, in fact, that slide's a little bit out of date, but uh, um, but uh, it's a, a, we, we're rolling out nationwide. We've got sensors everywhere in New Zealand. We've got dense networks in Christchurch and Wellington. And 
and we will let my time up now. <laughs> I thought I was doing pretty good. The, um, yeah, that was, um, uh, we're, we're, rolling out, we're rolling out nationwide now. We're fully active everywhere. Um, you want to sign up, go to our website, have a look at what's there. There's a free one month trial, including full function access to the mobile app, the, the website and so on and so on. It's, uh, we're, we're really excited by it. We've got some really big interest from a whole pile of different players from uh, key commercial companies, uh, professional services, right through to multi-asset uh, um, property portfolios like, um, um, oh, I better not name a few, but, but critical infrastructure and uh, um, uh, factories and so on. But uh, look, we're, we're absolutely thrilled with the reception that this has uh, um, had. We really thank Smart Cities and Christchurch City Council for their support. They've been the anchor, um, the anchor customer for this. Um, uh, so, who felt the earthquake this morning? Um, it was it was an interesting little shake. It was um, uh, just to give you an example. Most people in Christchurch probably didn't feel that too much, or basically passed it off as a little bit of a um, uh, little bit of a curiosity. But in but in Littleton, around Littleton, and on the southern side of the port, ran from Governors Bay to the Heads, that ground shaking um, approached or exceeded. Uh, the, the service limit for a 100% code new building. So um, there, are, there is that level of variation from even a relatively, from a re relatively trivial quake. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer questions and, um, and you can come and speak to me afterwards as well if you, if you, if you like. Come on. He scared the crap out of me telling Littleton's going to fall down. No, it was a Maybe quake this morning. I didn't feel it at home, but I live in North Canterbury, so. Are you looking at exporting this technology that's about to work? Yes. Yes, it's, um, <coughs> sorry, I'm going to cough again. It, um, it's got clear applicability in, a, in almost every seismically active area. The um, the key issue is not the technology. The key issue is finding a route into the market that uh, um, overcomes a lot of vested, vested interests and established relationships in those markets. Partic I'm thinking particularly places like California and so on. We, we, have, um, we do quite a lot of business, just traditional instrument sales in South America. Um, I'd say South America for us is actually probably a better, uh, a better option for the service. Um, it is, uh, so the answer to the first question, yes, it is cellular. Um, the, uh, the, um, although it doesn't have to be, the, the sensors are capable of operating on any uh, type of Ethernet connection, um, Wi-Fi, cable, um, 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 various others as well. But we chose cellular because our experience in both the Canterbury and the, um, uh, and the um, Kaikoura quakes is that the cellular data network is actually pretty robust. Um, and this thing is pumping out all its data in those one to two minutes when you're hiding underneath the, underneath the desk <laughs> and, uh, and not streaming Netflix, which is... <laughs> uh, there's one more. Uh, what is the typical cost? Um, it, it ranges depending on the customer, but it, the, the typical cost for a business is typically in the order of around about $200 a month. All our, um, all our data processing and all our um, data storage is in the cloud, um, um, as it is. I, I mean, that was a deliberate decision to put, put it into cloud-based servers. Um, beyond that, to be honest, we haven't, um, we haven't thought about the architecture too, too much more. One of the things that we would like to do is bring in a public element to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to the data share, effectively. There are some challenges, um, which is why we haven't gone that way right from the beginning. Um, in the... In, other parts of the world where um, uh, there's been various uh, programs, particularly in the United States, to effectively give away free seismographs to, to the public, 
and then pull the data. Um, the, um, it's a bit like uh, collateral debt obligations, collateral swap debt obligations in the financial crisis. The trouble is if one piece of data is bad, you don't know how, what the rest of it's like. Um, that's a... Um, that, that's a challenge, but I don't think it's over, um, uh, I don't think it's an impossibility either. I think we'd probably need our, our vision is some kind of simplified hardware device with some kind of user uh, um, uh, approval or registration that we could we could undertake before we allow the data to be um, to be validated, something like that. But uh, that's that's uh, that's certainly in the vision. Next step. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Oh, that's a, no, that's a really good question. Um, um, the best answer for an individual building is to have the sensor in it, or failing the sensor in it, very close by. And when I say very close by, within about 50 metres. Um, we don't try and interpolate, uh, you know, use a linear interpolation or some kind of soil model between it. It's too hard. It's too uncertain, and you end up with more questions than answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can, but the price goes up too. <laughs> Yeah, we have through the Smart Cities um, project here in, uh, in Christchurch. And uh, Neil mentioned the, um, the, the um, award. This, is, this has only been the last couple of weeks. We've uh, um, uh, the joint submission, Christchurch, Smart Cities, and, uh, and, and what we're doing here. Uh, it was the Asia Pacific Smart Cities, something or another. Um, <laughs> can't, can't quite remember exactly what it was, but it was, uh, um, uh, to be honest, we didn't think it had much of a chance, but actually it won, so uh, we, were, we, were, we were absolutely stoked, to be, to be honest. That, uh, um, uh, so yes, I think there is synergies. There's certainly synergies within New Zealand as well, um, in terms of um, other smart cities um, uh, projects. Um, but within the council organisations, the local governments are obviously a big stakeholder for us. We, we establish partnerships in terms of um, being able to utilise um, local government infrastructure, street furniture and so on, for, for the sensors. Um, and as, in return, effectively, the, um, the local government organisation gets the emergency response type information that they need, which gives them a city-wide view of the shaking, as opposed to just this building or that building or so on. Um, yeah, good, good question. We've... Um, uh, we deliberately stayed away from street lighting because there's um, there's some there'd be some unanswered questions on the effect of the uh, of the uh, of the street lighting pole on the on the behaviour of the sensor. We've actually done some tests on it, uh, and and from what I can see, it looks okay. But uh, but um, the the for the in Christchurch, for example, we've got about half the sensors are in buildings and half the sensors are in traffic signal cabinets which now that I'll mention them, you'll see them everywhere. They're on every single street corner. Each one controls a set of traffic lights and they're a small lightweight uh, steel structure with a solid concrete base. That's in, that's so, uh, so in terms of free field seismic mounting, they're actually pretty good. Um, in fact, couldn't, couldn't really do better actually in an urban environment. So um, yeah, we're pretty happy with that. And we'll call it there. Thanks Thank you. everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Then. Thanks, Len. Nigel. There's Nigel. Come on up, Nigel. Many of you will know Nigel or at least be aware of some of his companies. Uh, he's founder and managing director of Infact, who've developed 400 technology products over the years uh, for various <laughs> local companies. More recently, May 2017, PIP IoT was spun out. Um, 
And to be perfectly honest, I've forgotten what Nigel's going to talk about, but he'll tell you. Thank you, Nigel. I think it's all. Well, fortunately, I never said what I was going to talk about, so uh, <laughs> it can be about anything, right? Um, yeah, thanks for um, the opportunity to come and share a little bit of um, what we've been up to. It's um, it's great to be here with people and not on a screen, and it's great to be here in an amazing new facility, um, and it's a real privilege to be able to spend some time with uh, such talented and passionate uh, people in this Christchurch technology sector. Um, <clears throat> I think the fact that um, you're here tonight is a demonstration that you know we're all enthusiastic about growing this. Um, I've got a couple of sons who are, uh, are coming into their own and um, I want them to be involved in a high-tech New Zealand. Um, so um, <clears throat> great to have you here. Um, so what am I going to talk about tonight? Well, um, Smart Cities was the, the, the title that I got thrown, and I was like, well, that's a, a big dog to try and um, work through in 20 minutes. But I'll, I'll attempt to, um, to break down what Smart Cities means, particularly to me anyway, um, to us. Um, what, are the, what are the drivers behind Smart Cities? And probably some of the experiences that other cities are having around the world. Um, there's some good information coming available now. And then what are the challenges? And then I'm, I'm just going to briefly talk through um, three of the deployments that we've been involved with, which um, uh, bring it down to earth, and I can talk about the reality of it. <clears throat> so um, PIP IoT was um, spun out of Infact because we, Infact, started playing with low-power radios um, running on the unlicensed spectrum, and we mentioned it to a few people, and then we were inundated with requests for sensors. So we ended up about two weeks later with a rubbish bin sensor, a whole bunch of Christchurch City councillors, and Vicky Buck taking pictures and posting on Facebook saying, yay, you know, we've got bin sensors in Christchurch. And it was um, almost overwhelming, the response, because we got inquiries from everywhere, and I thought, man, we've got this new thing um, it was growing. I had to get it out of the design company because that didn't have the uh, capacity to cope with that. Um, and Pip was born, and um, it just seemed like this amazing experience where um, we had more work, more opportunities than we could deal with. Uh, money was coming in from everywhere, and we thought, man, this is fantastic. Well, things changed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's all right because they always do, don't they? I mean, you have fun for a while, and then you've got some lessons to learn. So. Um, but I'd just like to say that Christchurch City Council has been you know, a, a major influence in here. And people like um, Justin Anstis, who's Head of Innovation at Christchurch City Council, um, Theresa McCullum, Grace, who's here tonight, um, Nigel Cunningham, um, Cottingham, and, um, and City Care, um, Hugh Blake Manson, um, Michael Healy. Uh, these are people who are the entrepreneurs who are making smart cities happen. And you know, I, I, I congratulate them for their efforts because you know, they're working in this uh, dogma of an old bureaucratic system and they have to kind of break new ground and break mindsets and bring um, new things which are really important to our city, both in terms of the sustainability um, but also its livability. And we can't go on doing the same old shit that we're doing um, and expect that we can have the, the sort of privileged lifestyle that we've got today. So things have to change, and technology is the way to do that. Um, so PIP evolved a few sensors which were basically driven out of demand. So there's a level sense which goes in drains, bins, tanks. Um, it's a, a little device. It's IP68 rated. You can stick it pretty much anywhere, and it'll give you a distance measurement. Um, a people counter, so you can put it on the wall, and people walking past the counts will count cars and that sort of thing as well. Geosense is a little device with a GPS in it, and it will measure vibration um, and tilt. <coughs> and then Digi, which, which is um, the sort of heart of um, 
some of the bigger systems that we've deployed, which I'll talk about shortly. But that's the sort of um, suite of products. And then we, um, then we work through a process of, of building out um, an Azure backend with uh, an API con connection so that we could provide raw data into um, customers, cl councils, um, larger organizations back end so they could get their own analytics running and do their own visualization. <clears throat> so the whole system was built basically on a, um, a sensor with connectivity through to a point where um, people who had specialist knowledge about the networks that they were measuring could actually turn into information that would drive decision making. And the whole system, you know, we've, we've, we've struggled endlessly with, you know, where's the fine line between um, open and, hey, we need a little slice of the action as well. Um, so we kind of settled on, we're going to focus on device health. You guys focus on network health, and there should be a, a, a great place for us to meet in the middle. Um, as I said, it hasn't been an easy road, and we've had plenty of failures, um, embarrassing failures for a guy that's been in product development for, uh, you know, 30 years. But um, I don't know why I keep making the same mistakes that I do. <laughs> um, so let's kind of tackle this smart cities question. This was somebody else's, um, I think it was a Wikipedia. I hacked it a little bit though because I wanted to add a few things in there. But basically, the guts of it, so you can read it, guts of it is about communities sharing data. Right? So if, you've got, if you want a smart city, you have to have a whole lot of data coming from a whole lot of different sources. Sentinel, great, make it public get it into the system of things where um, a whole lot of different stakeholders can actually draw on that data and start deriving insights that can feed into next best action decisions. When we can't predict what's going to happen in three months or six months, we all know that, um, but we can certainly uh, use data to make decisions about next best action. And um, but we need you know, a, a diverse array of um, inputs to be able to create good beneficial outcomes for the community. Um, so, um, and I'll bang on a, about this a bit more, but it's, it's uh, crucial that we take a community focus and a collaboration, a collaborative <laughs> focus, um, and we share. Um, some of the scale IoT deployments in smart cities, um, electricity meeting, they've been around for a while. I uh, had a chat with a guy recently um, who's in that space. You know, there's data coming off those things which could be used a whole lot more productively than what it currently is. Like we've got EVs coming along. How are we going to solve that problem? Well, you know, there's a source of information coming out of electricity meters which could drive a lot of that decision making. Street lighting. Um, Interesting question about can you hook it up to the street lights? Not in New Zealand because we've got um, a spectrum that's got a big notch in it because Vodafone want to play in that space. Um, so um, we can't play with iTrons right now, but I'm sure somebody's going to sort it out at some point. Um, and <clears throat> water metering, which uh, you know, in, in some places it's got a, a whole lot of or massive number of deployments and in other places nothing. And we didn't value water here. Um, I think Auckland is now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's not just water metering how much you use, it's how much gets lost before it gets to the tap. Um, and it, that's going to be a big growth area. Um, um, in Christchurch, I think the number is sort of 20 to 30 percent gets lost before it hits the tap. Um, in the UK, in London, for example, it's about 40 percent. I think the Japanese got a lick because they've got stainless steel um, pipes going every, everywhere, and that's down about 10 percent. So that's a lot of water that just you know, drains away that never gets used for anything um, purposeful. Um, other things like um, people counting, you know, the COVID um, uh, scenario, we've been hit hard with requests for uh, people counting systems. And uh, dare I say it, the, um, the shittiest job of it all, um, the surge network. Um, it's, in most cities in the world, it's broken, overloaded, um, and flooding. In the UK, I think uh, a report I was reading, they've got something in the order of you know, two, three hundred million litres of water being um, dumped into UK rivers um, every year, and that's just what they're measuring. So 
that's a that's a really big problem that needs to be solved. So, um, <clears throat> what are the drivers for change then? Um, because you know everybody needs a reason to do something, and <clears throat> unfortunately, it's the burning platforms on public health and safety, which is top of the pops. And this is a a Microsoft IoT signals report that was published in July last year. Um, so if you have a, um, an E. coli problem in your water supply, then you're probably going to need to start measuring that. And that's what happened in Christchurch. Um, so two or three years ago, we got um, a, a, a request um, if we wanted to be involved in deploying telemetry on the, um, on the coronation scheme for Christchurch. Um, we had four weeks to do it, and um, budget was limited. But we did it, and I think that's the that's the amazing thing about IoT is that um, it's pretty lightweight. It's not like a SCADA system that takes months, even years to design, and uh, a lot of heavy duty equipment needs to go into place. Um, so you can move quickly, uh, as we proved with the coronation scheme. We'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, second off the rank is um, environmental and social compliance. Uh, yeah, we've gotten away with a hell of a lot for a long time, but the doors are closing. Um, and old practices that threaten sustainability are just completely unacceptable. Um, uh, one of those is, for example, nitrate levels um, on the Canterbury Plains. Uh, we were involved in a development with Lincoln Agritech a couple of years ago, developing a low-cost nitrate sensor that goes down wells. Um, there was a few sensors which were pretty expensive that ECAN had deployed. Um, now they've got 100 plus out there, and um, it's shocking news. Um, hell, they're a lot higher than we thought. Well, that's what happens when you start measuring stuff. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, <coughs> um, other examples like um, you know a pipe that sticks out of a manhole sump. Um, well, that pipe is an overflow or sewage. And if it's pointing at the river, if it overflows, it will go in the river. Um, so we put sensors in Dunedin a while back, and um, you know, we, we were looking at the data one morning. It's like, well, that overflowed for about two hours into this little stream that feeds into the leaf. Um, who knew about that? Well, we did, because we were measuring something. But nobody noticed, because it was raining at night, and you know, all the shit was gone by the next day. Well, it's still there, but... So, so these are um, really important subject areas that need to be addressed with data. You can't, you can't just imagine a fix and go away and do it. You have to actually measure it, know what's going on, know where the problem exists, and then spend the money fixing the thing um, that's broken and not uh, expect to be able to um, you know, produce some nice literature that says, you know, we're addressing the problem, because you ain't until you start measuring what it is. <coughs> Infrastructure management, um, I won't go too much into that, but really it's about getting more performance out of existing infrastructure. Um, a, a, a great one um, is the, um, <coughs> the surge um, network for Christchurch City. Um, there's a thing called the Northern Relief. Um, it's kind of a strange name for it, but it's the pumping station that takes all the shit and puts it somewhere else. Not quite sure where it goes, but the Northern Relief. <laughs> Who thought up that name? Um, but that, that floods, I don't know, I've heard numbers, but like maybe six, eight times a year, and it all spills into wetlands and other surrounding areas. It's about a $400 million council problem. Um, no one is spending that money. Uh, so engineers got to the job and decided that maybe we could build some big reservoirs. Well, that's a $100 million problem. But we're still just like thinking up these big schemes to fix a to fix a problem that happens for reasons we don't know because we're not measuring it. So um, you know what I'm going to say next. Let's start measuring it. And uh, there's a really clever guy who died during lockdown, Rob Meek. I want to mention him. Um, amazing man, very very clever, very innovative. Uh, he's come up with a, a system of things that we're working on now as a council. I can't tell you anything about it, but um, it will it will come to uh, it will come to light 
and um, that's being well supported by the council. And this is a an IoT solution with a bit of sort of mechanical stuff hanging off the back of it that can solve that hundred million, four hundred million dollar problem. And um, I think that's that's really powerful example. Um, well, there's lots of powerful examples, but they're, they're, um, <coughs> it's so simple to measure what what's happening and make good decisions. The problem is getting people to make decisions to actually put the measurement technology in place. And I think that's what Sentinel's finding is, <coughs> why are you resisting? I mean, it's a, it's a $200 a month to save you, what, massive five-year headache fighting an insurance company? I mean, it's a no-brainer, but for some reason, that's humanity and changing mindsets. Um, so uh, what are the key challenges for smart cities deployment? Um, interestingly enough, uh, they weren't about mindsets, but um, a lot about uh, complexity and technical challenges. And I think the, the reality is, and this is, you know, like I, I started PIP IoT thinking, sure, this is going to be easy. I mean, it's a radio and a battery and all the stuff that we've done before. But actually making it work in a, in a manhole and then getting this tiny little radio with a tiny little antenna to transmit out of a hole in the ground to a uh, very far away receiver and then push that down another um, uh, connection to a server which then has to be constructed in a way which can do a whole bunch of back-end stuff that I don't understand and produce a piece of information that then alerts somebody else to go and take an action to put a man in a truck to go and fix it. Well, when we started trying to do that, it was like, oh, this is actually kind of hard. So, um, so I believe that that should be at the top of the list. Um, but I, I, I also believe that uh, we shouldn't be scared of that because um, you know, technical challenges and complexity are solvable. Uh, what's not solvable is somebody who's folding their arms and saying, I'm not going to do that. And then the harder you push, the more resistant they become. That's not solvable. Technical challenges, you know, we're all good at solving technical challenges. We love solving them. So um, <coughs> word is council spend more money on smart cities and, uh, and grow uh, the, uh, the base of technology problem solvers um, who can uh, facilitate the, the successful investment in making our city smarter. Um, so lack of budget and staff resources and all those, they're all kind of known things. But um, it's interesting that, uh, you know, as far as the IoT signals Microsoft report was concerned, that was, uh, um, that was a breakdown. <coughs> so um, some examples which I had mentioned. Um, you know, uh, people are dying in Hawke's Bay because of E. coli and suddenly we measure stuff in our own wells and um, it becomes a public emergency and we need to do something about that. Um, so this, the DigiSense you can see there <coughs> was connected up to tanks and pumps um, and um, those, those pumping stations were distributed around the city, threw together a, a, a bit of a visual display and then started building some layers in there for reporting. So that whole system now is um, you know, kind of like automated. Uh, People, men in trucks, get told when they need to go and fill a tank. Um, they use a, a, a QR code login to say I'm here, and they do their audits and they fill the tank. Um, you know, changes from red to, or orange to green, and everybody's happy. And um, you know, get this funny tasting water as a result of it. So everybody's winning, um, and it hardly costs anything to do. So. Um, <coughs> So that happened really quickly um, and really efficiently. And everybody who was involved in that process collaborated. We were all focused on the community problem. We all shared information. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't an economic value equation. It was a community um, safety, public safety um, equation that we were solving for. And um, it was amazing what happened. You know, it's like, it's just so easy. I've been, I've been in endless um, you know, RFP bids with, with councils you know, all, all around the world, and they're really hard. Like, 
you know, I've got to predict the future in about three years of what all the risks are going to be and how much it's going to cost. I mean, okay, so I just think up a, I work out a number, maybe, you know, it's 100,000. You have to multiply it by 10 so that I'm not carrying it. And so, you know, you end up pitching something which is freaking astronomical. Nobody really knows what the risks are. Nobody knows what the problems are. Nobody knows how we're going to solve them. Nobody knows what the value is. It's just making a whole lot of shit up and hoping that your shit's better than somebody else's. <laughs> so, so I've been you know, bantering um, counsellors and bantering with um, various people around the place to, to try and solve this problem that we've had because it's, it's a massive inhibitor of what we need to do. Um, and we need, we need trusted partners. We need people to step forward and say, yeah, I'll, I'll take a risk alongside you because it's worth it for where we live and for sustainability, for the environment, and for the people here. Um, so, um, so how do we do that? Well, interestingly enough, the Australians have a really nice system, which I thought was way better than what we do here. And that is the expression of interest is, would you like to come and play? And we're going to pick a bunch of you who look like likely candidates. And then, guess what? You have to play together. And you've got to share stuff. Because you're going to be much better playing together than you are if we just give it to one of you and then hope that you're going to be successful. So I'm hoping that you know, some of that uh, way of thinking might, might infiltrate um, what we do here in this fair land. Um, <coughs> Environmental and social. Um, so bins overflowing in high-profile public areas. Uh, interestingly enough, those high-profile areas were um, where the politicians lived, <laughs> and they had influence over uh, bureaucrats and council, and council then had influence over contractors, and then all of a sudden we started getting inquiries for bin sensors because they needed to um, know when those bins were full so we can't empty them. Um, but also then they realised that... Um, there was this uh, real cost of um, truck movements going from uh, uh, New Lynn all the way out to the Manukau heads and emptying a bin that wasn't, wasn't full. And when they started realising that um, these sensors could actually give them that information before they got in the truck, um, kind of dollar signs lit up. Um, then there was the short staffing scenario so uh, you know we don't have enough people turning up to work every day what are we where are we going to deploy them uh, 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 oh guess I'm the manager here so I'm going to send you just clean that toilet um, up the road um, in the meantime I've got you know a flood going somewhere else they don't know about it because we don't have the data so these were learnings that started to come into play but I will say that um, interestingly enough when we when we were involved in this um, a couple of years ago, we didn't have the analytics tools, we didn't have the AI engines to be able to break down the information um, into um, next, next best action steps. So the whole system kind of um, ground to a deployment halt. And that happened about um, you know, 500 sensors. So really importantly, for those of you who are in the space of um, analytics and AI, uh, you know, helping out us kind of sensor hardware um, connectivity guys with some of the smart stuff to um, make men and trucks more efficient is, would be really useful. And I know you're working on it anyway. Um, so a third one. Um, this is infrastructure management. Um, and I've talked about you know, the, uh, the northern relief problem. And that's pretty much what that's about. So you know, we've got an old sewage network. It needs a lot of measurement. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, interestingly, the, the, the civil engineers who, um, who work with surge networks, for example, I mean, they've got no idea what goes on down there. They, they use models. So they put some sensors in and they work out that, um, you know, this, uh, this flow here must be coming from these other two groups. Um, one, <coughs> one story I, I was being told was that this um, new subdivision in Mapua uh, the sewage network was being um, inundated with stormwater and no one knew where it was coming from. And they had all the, all, pulled out all their models and uh, you know, scratching around trying to find um, some source of infiltration. 
And then um, one young uh, building inspector turned up one day and said, oh, I think there's um, quite a few of the um, drainage contractors putting uh, you know, stormwater from house roofs directly into the sewer main. Um, so they found their water supply because somebody had actually gone there and looked. But um, you know, if they'd put some more sensors around the place, they would have been able to see that. So um, in summary, we go, put in summary. Um, you know, I, I just say again, Smart Cities is about community, it's about sharing, it's about collaboration, um, it's about having a whole range of um, really clever people and smart companies sitting around uh, an important need and all working together to try to come up with solutions that, um, that deliver benefit, um, deliver outcomes that we can't achieve with the complexities that we have to deal with. Um, local authorities, I just say, you know, please, 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 um, don't pit us against each other, bring us together in a collaborative manner and, and facilitate a discussion because we're all big people and we can all work out how we're gonna how we're gonna play and share, but we just need to be given the opportunity. Um, and the true value of uh, of smart cities IoT isn't always apparent at the start, but if you're applying um, that to a valuable uh, um, environmental social need, then the value will will appear um, for and solving that need, but the spin-off uh, will provide endless opportunity for a whole bunch of smart kids and other companies to use the data to invent new new value, economic value that we could never have thought possible. We just need um, the opportunity to see the data in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Any questions? We'll repeat the questions from the floor as we get them because the online people can't hear. question was around awareness of GovPAC in Australia and open data initiatives in New Zealand. Um, I'm aware, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know very much about them. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I can have a chat yeah, sure. Go on, share your fail failures, Nigel. Oh, you know, it's just the usual stuff, shipping a thousand products up to Europe with a firmware bug that, it's kind of embarrassing, <laughs> <laughs> particularly when there's no OTA on it, so, you know. It's dumb stuff. It's, well, it's dumb, but it's also, um, you know, in the, in the process of um, of enthusiastically um, creating new products, you know, there's there's a um, there's there's the the trail of kind of um, debris that you leave behind you, and you need to go and sweep it up. And so, when you actually deliver the first product, and then um, you know you get uh, some firmware bugs, or some mechanical failures, or some ingress, or um, Know, the uh, the system, the API, uh, you know, people can't log into it because of some feature. It's it's all that stuff that probably if we had bigger budgets and you know, a lot more people, we might be able to mop up a bunch of that stuff before we get to it, but um, before it gets to you. But um, at the end of the day, I think you know, one overwhelming response that we've had from from our customers is that. Um, they love the support, so just stepping up to uh, to say, yeah, actually it was a uh, firmware bug, and um, ship them all back, and we'll put it right. Um, you learn, don't you? Again, one more, come on.
Uh, yeah, databasing and reporting tools, absolutely. So um, when we go up, we, pro we provide an API. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a kind of thin layer of device health management that we provide and some installation tools and that sort of thing. So, um, and we'd love to do more. But uh, essentially, we you know we see that you know we're not the experts in um, the subject matter of what they're measuring. So we would rather have that relationship where we can you know they get some benefit and then they come back and say okay we want to do more of this, um, and and we have this sort of mutual f um, flow of of benefit back and forth. Well, I, I think um, that lackey. <laughs> <laughs> from an OEM perspective, yeah, um, tough one. Um, so there are there are significant trends, um, you know, where, uh, as I mentioned before, we where we have big networks like sur surge networks. Water is a massive, massive issue, issue globally, and um, uh, for any company globally to try and tackle a water problem alone would be, you know, complete. They'd be completely swamped. Um, but I think uh, you know that's certainly where PIP is focusing its attention is in the water space. So there's three waters. So there's uh, the sewage, the stormwater. In this reticulated water, and um, you know, no one, no one, no one company is going to eat that elephant because um, just there's just too many complexities, too many too many variables to deal with. So if you want to if you want to play, then I suggest that's a good one. Um, other utilities, uh, you know, the electricity space. We all think that's done. We haven't even started on electricity yet. Um, you know, we've got smart meters, yeah, but that was massive management system that needs to be put in place. We don't even know that we've burned out a transformer um, on a power pole. So there's, there's massive, massive opportunities there as well. I think the, I think this, you know, utilities, health, health is slightly um, tougher play, um, uh, but certainly in the, um, in kind of uh, making sure that your people are safe space, so man down sensors and that sort of thing. Okay, another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Don't eat it all at once. Don't give it, give it to your dog because it's chocolate and that's poison for them. Thank you. I'll, I'll share it around here, right? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Nigel. Oh. Steady. Health and safety issue at the front here. That's our evening. Um, thanks to Len and Nigel for doing most of the talking. Thanks to all of you for turning up tonight. It's great to see a decent turnout for our first in-person event for some time. And, and a few of you online, I'm looking at you. Um, there's not much beer left because you've all been really thirsty earlier on and the food's all gone, but do mingle and mix before you head off. and. Um, Show up next time in roughly four weeks' time. What's the date? Oh, early August anyway. First, first, first Tuesday in August. Thanks for coming.